Food. Something that all of us have to get into our homes. What do we do when it runs out? For a huge proportion of the world's population, there is a very familiar process. We jump in the car, we drive down to our supermarket, we go up and down the aisles of the car park trying to find somewhere to park, we go up and down the aisles of the supermarket trying to find everything on our list, we queue behind other families and other screaming children, some of them our own, we pay, we have the privilege of packing all of our own groceries, we carry them back to our car, and we drive home, ready to repeat the process again next week. So at Ocado, we don't really think any of that should be necessary. We are on a mission to change the way the world shops. My name's Matt. Uh, these days I'm head of new technology development in a division called the Office of the CTO at Ocado. That's our research and development division, and uh, I run a small research lab here in Stockholm. Uh, there's a couple of my colleagues here today as well. Please do come and say hello after the talk if you'd like to know more about what we do in Stockholm specifically. So the problem that we're trying to solve at Ocado is an interesting one in terms of logistics. If you think about the last time you bought something online, uh, usually in the UK we'd take Amazon as an example, but you haven't quite been invaded by them yet, so we'll have to uh, maybe talk about Web Halen or Dustin. But the last time you bought something, how many items were in your basket when you checked it out? Usually one or two, sometimes five, very rarely more than 10. The average basket size for grocery is 50. That's across three temperature regimes, the ambient, chill, and frozen selection. And we have all sorts of different rules about how we should pack things, because we can't put bleach in with the strawberries, and we can't put the milk on top of the eggs. So it's just a very, very difficult many-to-many -many sortation problem that we're trying to solve that doesn't actually exist in many other logistics sectors. We also have hugely demanding customers. So our UK operation, we offer a one-hour delivery slot staggered every 30 minutes through the day from 5.30 a.m. until 11.30 p.m. We also have incredibly accurate deliveries because we don't do this. So the vast majority of online groceries that you can buy today in most countries around the world are fulfilled in store, which means people are competing with other customers to get the products that you've ordered and they can't guarantee that it's in stock and someone else hasn't taken it across off the shelf before they arrived. So we have no stores, and everything that we sell comes from centralized customer fulfillment centers that we call CFCs. So we operate what's called a hub and spoke model in logistics. There's the three large white markers on this map are those fulfillment centers where everything is picked and packed, and it's either delivered directly from there or sent further to a spoke site shown with the dark markers uh, for transshipment. And because we have this model, we can know everything that's available to promise our customers, which allows us to have uh, industry-leading uh, accuracy of our orders. You get what you actually ordered. We also, by centralizing, can have massive amounts of automation to augment and increase the efficiency of our human operators. So this is an example of a goods-to-person pick station. A pick operator can stand still, the product's brought to the pick operator in the green box, that might be your eggs or your milk, and your shopping's being aggregated in the red box on the left-hand side. And that allows us to pick four or more times faster than you can in the equivalent store pick, so usually about 10 plus items a minute in one of these facilities. And that kind of facility, the photo that's shown here, has a huge amount of machinery inside it. So it's kilometers of conveyor, which is connecting everything in a huge facility. Um, to give you a sense of how that looks, I've got a quick video of a visualization here. So it's a four-story building. This is a schematic of the conveyor network with the floors taken out. And you can see these long aisles, uh, and these boxes shown in blue are traveling down the aisles, collecting the items that the customer wants. So this kind of warehouse, notable for its lack of robots, given the subjects of this talk, is how we used to do things. So it's important to show this to understand its limitations. These, these facilities would be considered state-of-the-art in almost all logistics sectors in the world. We've been doing this for more than 10 years now, and we know it's got some shortcomings. So you have to build everything up front, because to stock your full range, you need conveyors connecting your full range. So you need your capital very early. 
You also have single points of failure or very expensive redundancy and extra conveyors. And it takes two to three hours for one of those boxes to actually travel through the site. So that puts uh, a lower bound on how quickly you can deliver things to your customers. So we now do things a bit differently. Uh, we have a system that looks like this. So this is swarms of robots that we just call bots traveling around on a grid structure with a hoist where they can pick up the top box from stacks of boxes stored under the grid. They lift the box into their belly and then they drive around uh, controlled by a central planning system written in Java, which is shown with the blue markers here. Now that lets us take our whole range, put it in very compact storage, and enable this same goods to person operation. So as you can see here, a human operator is just having boxes presented on the left hand side, can pick and pack the order very, very quickly, and then that box is collected and stored by one of the robots. We can now pick a complete customer order in around five minutes because we've moved everything to be very, very parallel. So this is really important as the world moves towards uh, demanding more immediacy in a lot of e-commerce. So we can build small centers near our customers, and we actually are trialing a new service in West London at the moment where you can order your groceries, and from the moment you press buy in the app, we'll have it in your house within the hour. And actually, our average delivery time is below 30 minutes. So. This is one of those facilities in real life. This is some drone footage of a live site. It looks a little bit like CGI because drones are amazing, but the, um, this is a bunch of real robots. And the robots are, are quite serious machines. So I've got some stats coming out, but I'll let this run for a moment because it's a nice video. So let's take a look at what these machines are actually doing. So these grids are enormous. Uh, the one in that video is about 240 meters long. Uh, it would have about 600,000 boxes stored inside it. Uh, as we see here, three football fixtures in size. Thousands of them in operation, all from one central Java system doing the control. They move pretty fast, and they pass each other with a five millimeter clearance. So there's some very tight tolerance engineering in the, in the site as well. Uh, and they're big, heavy machines carrying 35 kilogram payloads. Now, as you see here, we talk to each one 10 times a second, so there is a, a real uh, real-time requirement on this system as well, which is interesting when you're working with Java. So, having a look at the general system, there's two main code bases at play. We've got the C firmware that's running on the bot. We actually use a Java simulation to test that firmware, which I'm not talking about today, but do come and ask me afterwards if you're interested. And then we've got the control system. Now that's responsible for how every single bot moves what it does, when and why, and where every single box lives in the system. It's plain old Java, it's an event-based architecture, and it has to make sure things don't crash, it has to handle stock coming in from suppliers, this picking process where we're aggregating all of the products, getting them in the right box at the right time, the outbound process of pulling all the completed orders together to go out on a van or a trailer, and all of the other things that go into running a production site. So, maintenance, charging, re-optimizing the layout of boxes between shifts in downtime overnight and that kind of thing. So why Java? Often get asked, why not C++ for a real-time system? And it is, of course, a trade-off between speed of development and performance, except some of the performance is a misnomer because, as I'm sure lots of people in this room know, you can write Java code that can run just as fast as C if you're doing it right. So we do, of course, have to deal with garbage collection. That is uh, probably the biggest single technical hurdle when working in real time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. But for us, a high-level language where we can move fast is fantastic. The huge ecosystem of libraries and tools, the ease of debugging with the JVM is, is unparalleled. The fact that it's an evolving platform, so we benefit for free from improvements in developer productivity and application performance just by choosing Java is a huge win. And we're a reasonably large growing company. So the large global developer pool, the fact that it allows internal mobility between our teams as well, because we don't just use Java for control systems, it's our core language at Ocado, are all big ticks in the Java box. Uh, we're Platinum sponsors the Adopt OpenJDK project. It's such a vested interest in the ongoing success of Java that we felt that was appropriate. We're proud to be supporters. So what do we actually do with it? So one of the main things that makes the system that you saw in the videos possible 
is the simulation that the control system is developed against. And wh what are we simulating? So it's primarily hardware, but we actually include people in that, uh, in that equation because they are certainly physical things moving around. So we have to simulate because we need to make sure that we've designed the right warehouse before we build it. And these things are tens or hundreds of millions of pounds to build. So it really is important to be able to test things ahead of time, not just in terms of code, but in terms of the stuff you're actually going to build. We need to evaluate algorithmic improvements without hoping that they don't kill our warehouse performance. We need to move fast in terms of software development without needing a team of testers to run physical hardware for us. We need to inject errors in a way that doesn't actually cause downtime. And we also need, when we change an algorithm that might look great in production today, we have to evaluate it against the end game performance of that warehouse, because these things ramp up over time uh, in line with customer demand. So we have to check them against our future profile as well. So simulation is great for all of those things. But it is also, of course, just an approximation. And you have to always bear in mind, if you develop against a simulation, how you actually flick the switch into a real production environment later. Uh, and there's a bit of discipline involved in getting that right. So we model the software systems with which our control system interacts. They're usually not mocks or stubs. They're actually usually simplified re-implementations um, to allow us to feed the input events, like customer orders, for example, coming in to decide what we do in the shed. We have to model all of the hardware that's running, so that's the bots themselves and also all of the other MHEs, so that's conveyors and uh, the pick stations that you saw the operators working at, uh, and all of the people who actually make things happen because the pickers are the people who do the real work. So sometimes you need to make a trade-off between the fidelity that you need and how easy it is to implement. And an example that's quite good for demonstrating this is how a bot moves. So in the real world, a bot moves a little bit like this, speed time graph, and you can see the curved corners in that graph, which is the, the jerk phase, the rate of change of acceleration there. If you were a physicist, that would be very important. If you're someone who's writing the actual code to calculate where a bot is at a given time based on a jerk-based model, you're less enthusiastic about it. We've done it, it wasn't that much fun. And we know now that it's much, much easier to use a constant acceleration approximation, which is more than accurate enough given that we only actually operate at a 100 millisecond uh, interval in terms of how the bot communicates in the real world. So we don't need that level of fidelity underneath. And these kind of uh, trade-offs, you, you learn a little bit when you start to operate in this space. And the type of simulation we use is discrete event simulation. So I've been at Ocado about nine years, and from my first day at Ocado, I've been working with discrete event simulation and can't stress enough what a wonderful tool it is when you learn how to use it. Um, you can look at the complex sort of Wikipedia style definition, but it's potentially better to just take a, a visual representation. So the four red boxes are status reports from one of these simulated bots because we talk to them every 100 millisecond. And you'll see in simulation time, they're perfectly spaced because we control that. But when the simulation generates one of those events, it's passed into the control system, a new bot status is ready, and the control system acts on that in some way. And in real time, that could take an arbitrary amount of time to actually calculate and process because it might be running some path search, it might be doing some optimization. It's not necessarily consistent between status messages, but it doesn't matter because we're in charge of time. So we have completely decoupled how long it takes something to execute from the passage of time in the simulation itself. And this is great because usually things that happen on CPUs running at gigahertz are faster than things that happen in the real world. So you can now process time as quickly as you can process events in your actual software. So that usually turns days into hours for us in terms of uh, actually modeling how our warehouses perform. So discrete event simulation is great for that. But on top of those speed up capabilities, it also lets us have proper determinism in our code. So all of our test cases and our simulations are completely repeatable for the same input data and parameters. Uh, even though they're enormously complex systems because we're controlling time. So real-time systems are, of course, non-deterministic, and 
the benefit of determinism when you start to get to these big complex algorithms is is really hard to to do justice um, you can find very very complex bugs in bits of your AI processes by just leaving a simulation running over the weekend or maybe leaving a thousand running over the weekend on a compute cluster and you can come back on Monday and one of them failed and you just put a breakpoint on the place before it failed and hit go again and you know that you're going to hit the precise moment where the error occurred because it will do the same thing and for bugs that you don't know exist yet that's a really powerful tool so we actually test for this in our CI pipeline uh, which is actually as simple as run the same simulation twice and diff the event log because when you get any kind of divergence there is typically a butterfly effect in these systems you'll get the same aggregate performance you usually get the same rates but you will not see the same events so three things you need to do with a discrete event simulation to achieve determinism in your code you need to look at time scheduling and iteration so we can go through these with some examples the first is time obviously the most important because we're controlling time and that's the purpose of this simulation so single source of truth for what the time is and that is not the system clock so we have a time provider and we're going to have one instance somewhere that's deciding what the time is simple enough that single instance in a discrete event simulation we need to be able to set what the time is as events take place so when we process an event we're going to update the time so this is the same instance but we have access to the set time as well still pretty simple when we come into the real-time space it's gonna just look like this so there's nothing wrong with asking what the system clock is you just need to put it through an abstraction so you can switch between discrete event and real time now we need to schedule things so we have a fully event-based system, again, necessary to work with discrete event simulation. What's an event? It's something that happens at a time and it can be run or canceled. And a scheduler is something where you can say, do this as soon as you finish processing the current event or do this at some time in the future. So far, so simple. A discrete event scheduler is the core of a discrete event simulation and it is a trivial thing. We have one of these adjustable time providers which is providing the source of what the time is to everything in your code base and you have a queue of events that you can schedule into then you run a while loop where you pop events off and run them but every time you run an event you update the clock so now that we've processed an event next time someone asks the time we know what it is and because we have to discretize all of our modeling to fit into this space that always is the correct time because nothing happens in the spaces between so we obviously have a real-time version of this as well but we'll talk about that in specific detail in a moment so the last thing is iteration uh, here's an example of doing iteration wrong if you have a data structure that doesn't give you a guaranteed iteration order your code isn't going to run the same time uh, the same way twice although sometimes it will which can be a little bit frustrating but generally speaking if you work with these systems quite a lot this just becomes behavior that you just train out of yourself and you'll never do it and there's a really really simple alternative which is use the immutable version obviously you can use an explicitly sorted collection as well if that's appropriate but this has a repeatable iteration order across runs of the same application so with those things in your toolbox you can now write arbitrarily complex algorithms and test them in a way that's very very easy to do which is massively powerful and is certainly what made our system possible but you don't have that safety blanket in production how do you handle your low latency comms so we've got some requirements here we have to be able to schedule events still because we have an event-based system they need to happen at specific times not get delayed and we have to have high enough throughput that we can keep up with everything that's happening in the system so a common tool for this type of problem is a scheduled thread pool executor now that's a perfectly good tool for most use cases but it actually doesn't work for us so depending on the size of thread pool you use you may need to create a new thread to handle an event which takes some time and even if you have enough threads you might need to wake one of them up and that takes some time and all of those tiny little time windows add up and we actually find that this can't keep up with our application when we get to very high bot numbers so we have something that looks crude but actually works pretty well uh, that we use instead called a busy loop so this is remarkably similar to the discrete event scheduler that we saw earlier except it's spinning a while true uh, when there's no events for it to process 
So that is not, not complex to understand, but you do need to be aware of the implications of it. So advantages, very, very low latency. It's effectively instant processing as long as you can keep up with the throughput if your individual events don't use all the CPU that you have available. For us, we found that we got about a three times higher throughput of events uh, when running in real time using this approach. Disadvantages, we're obviously completely uh, locking a CPU core by doing it, and you actually get that core pretty hot, so you do slow down its clock speed a little bit by doing this, but we still see the huge performance improvements when we do so. Memoization. So this is the kind of thing where you're playing a little bit and maybe paying the cost a little bit for all of the nice things you get with Java. You're now in the world of handling memory or handling memory where it matters. So two flavors of memoization. Standard memoization, there is a functional piece of code that computes an expensive result. So I compute it once and I cache it and I look it up next time. And object caching, which you only use in some very specific circumstances, but it's really important for us. So an example would be a coordinate class, which if you're doing a grid-based path search algorithm, you can imagine you use every now and then. Uh, if we instantiated new coordinate objects every time we needed to talk about a location, it would be billions and billions of events a minute, probably. Uh, so it's far, far better to use object caching there, which is as simple as a private constructor, a static create function, and look it up. So the next thing, garbage collection. Here are some tools which we reluctantly use where necessary. And you do have to listen to Donald Knuth here and only actually do this where it's really, really needed. But down in the low latency part of the application, you just can't afford the GC pauses. So you basically take most of your syntactic sugar out. You take your optionals away from your APIs, back to for loops, and use array back data structures. You also leave comments when you do this saying why, because otherwise a very well-meaning colleague is going to come and say that would be much prettier as a stream and undo your uh, important optimization. The log line is an interesting one as well because of the way that actually boxes and unboxes a double and creates an object just to spit out the log line. So there are some... Um, when you really get to the fast stuff, there are some places you have to be very careful. But for us, it is a very, very thin layer of our application where any of this is necessary. So some other tips with garbage collection. Turn the logs on. You don't really have to know what they mean yet, but you might need to come back and look at them. Format changed not that long ago, so there's a little bit of reading required sometimes. But they're cheap to write, and they're really, really useful. And you need to understand what the different collectors are for as well. So you can't just take the exciting one that people are blogging about. Um, we found uh, ZGC has been really, really positive. Um, we use this in production now. This is some pause times uh, from a representative test environment for a production system. And we've got the percentiles on the bottom and then a logarithmic scale of stop times in seconds. So a low line is better. ZGC consistently outperforming G1, GC in this case, and also winning in throughput terms. So this is um, the total application time, bigger bar is better, missing bit of the bar is pause time. For a 12 hour test, we were seeing about seven and a half minutes of pause time with G1, GC, and that reduced to just under one and a half minutes with ZGC. It's a great example of how the continually evolving Java ecosystem really does give you stuff for free sometimes, and that is just fantastic. Interestingly, we actually still use uh, Parallel GC when working in discrete event because it's batch mode, because we don't care about how much time passes and whether we pause. We're more interested in just how many events can we process per second. So the same application, when we run it in slightly different contexts, we use different garbage collectors because it affects performance, which is why you really do need to understand what each one is for. So in summary, grocery's hard. And we've spent a long time, we've been around since the year 2000 uh, over in the UK. Uh, we spent a long time figuring out how to get economies of scale to do this stuff profitably. And uh, Java is really at the core of uh, the technology that gets us there. So we use it within all of our CFCs, um, in many levels of our application stack as well. It's not just in this core control system. But for the controller, 
simulation is a really key tool. It's a core competency for us uh, and something that we're surprised more people don't use more. Uh, but we've now got a very large simulation department and um, Java is definitely at the core of that. Add some abstractions for determinism in your code. It's just a good idea. Determinism is great, makes everything easier. And listen to the good Donald and start simple and don't optimize early. So one last point and then uh, happy to take some questions. If any of that sounds interesting, come and talk to us afterwards. Uh, again, we do have roles in Stockholm in the simulation space. So if uh, this sounds like your kind of thing, we'd love to hear about it. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, is there any questions? Yes. Yes, you run your uh, simulations in tests of bare metal or liquid container or something? Uh, the simulations are bare metal. So we don't use any frameworks. So everything's plain old Java. Um, ag again, we really, really like ease of debugging really complex stuff. So we, do, we don't particularly like having uh, a spring or any of its friends in the way. We quite like to take a bit of a hit on having some instantiation code ourselves so that there's, there's nothing in our stack that makes it harder to figure out what's going on. Um, and it, it's just more things you don't have to investigate when you're debugging performance as well. Some other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering about those frozen gifs. Like, uh, how do you keep the temperature and everything visible? So frozen is actually not in one of those. So uh, we run in ambient and chill. Uh, they've, ev even that difference has got some challenges in terms of battery chemistry and how electronics fares in the cold and that kind of thing. But um, frozen is, is too small a chunk of our operation to warrant the automation. So of those 50 items in the average order, it's 27 ambient, 22 chill, and one frozen. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't qualify yet. It's on the, the longer to-do list. So it's a trolley pick operation there. If one of those robots stops in the middle of that grid, what happens then? So they do. Um, one of the things that you learn when you operate these at scale is that you know, re reliability is, uh, is a challenge. So if you have a bot that, to take a sort of arbitrary number, if you say that a bot can run for 1,000 hours without any kind of failure, so that's a month and a half of 24-7 operation, sounds really reliable put 3,000 of them in one system and you have a failure every 20 minutes. So you have to design for failure. Uh, and we have all kinds of uh, reporting that the bot does up to the control system. It can tell us when it's in trouble. We have automatic stranding, so we don't actually need any human intervention in nearly all cases. If a bot has some kind of issue, it will tell us it's had an issue and if we can either limp it home, uh, if it can still drive around, and if it's had a more serious issue, then we can just exclude the cell that it's on, and we usually perform what's called a dynamic replan. So we'll strip out any paths, intersect with that cell and replan them. Sometimes uh, we can't keep up with that planning, so we do what's called a controlled stop, where we delete the plan and recalculate it, and we stop for maybe 10 seconds, and um, we just continue. And because grocery has, um, there's a shape of the day, so we start at about 7 p.m. to start picking to get the earliest orders out to trunk to a spoke site, et cetera. There, there's a, a profile and there's a, a quiet window where we're mainly doing housekeeping operations on the grid, moving boxes around to re-optimize, and we can send engineers out then to collect any bot that's had a serious failure. <coughs> I've noticed that on the video, your robots are all are a square or rectangular. Have mm -hmm. you ever considered other shapes like hexagons? We thought about it. Um, we, we didn't come up with anything clever enough to warrant it. So it's a more expensive machine. That's, that's the minimum number of wheels, right, which is eight. So as soon as you go to a hexagon, you're suddenly a 12-wheel machine and, and you have to buy more wheels and motors and everything else. Um, it's... Shorter paths. Sorry? Shorter paths. Shorter paths. So, so there's certainly a trade-off between how many of the machines you need because you can plan more optimally uh, and how much the machine costs. I don't think anyone's come up with a smart hexagonal routing algorithm yet at Ocado, even as a test project. Um, 
but I, I suspect it drives more cost. Uh, both, it, it, there's the cost of the bot and also the cost of the box, for example, which then gets more expensive as well. We might have 3,000 bots and they would be operating 800,000 boxes. So a pound in the box and a pound in the bot mean different things uh, economically as well. Let's say we need to trade off the systemic performance against the, the basic upfront capital as well, which is what one of the things we test for in simulation. Um, we, we can actually look at the, the difference between having fewer pick stations that we run at a higher rate because we're running lots and lots of bots to keep the human operators fed with constant work. But because of the congestion around those stations, you actually pay a disproportionately high cost in bots. So you're trading off the operational cost of the human labor against the, the capital cost. Um, and we, we can test for all these things in simulation um, because the simulation is running the real control system. So it does sort of speak the truth in terms of what the performance of the system is. What about like the planning that goes on after the bots have picked the order? Sorry? Af after the yeah. bots are complete? So an order's complete, we will, uh, we store the completed orders back in the grid because we need to aggregate the 80 boxes that go on the back of a van or 80 times four that go on a, a trailer. And we then have a large Java routing system that's doing all of the optimization of the actual on-road uh, van fleet, so that's in-house as well. And we have uh, real-time updates of those with all the fresh orders coming in as well. So we could still be picking in one van and making changes to the route because someone just ordered something. And with the immediacy that's offered here, the cutoff window can be really late. So we can actually inject a new order and change the van's route and everything's sort of tied together. So having all of these processes in-house is, is really, really powerful. Fully automated uh, picking stations. So we have um, quite a large robotics research team. Uh, we have got a robotic picking cell live in our flagship facility in London. Um, grocery is again a really, really challenging sector for robotic pick. So we range 58,000 product lines, uh, and that's everything from the type of simple cardboard box that a lot of e-commerce would handle up to things that are incredibly hard for robotics. So if you imagine a, a polythene bag full of apples, which you would grab trivially, you have a reflective and transparent surface, and you have something where you have to grab one of the interior objects to get a candle on it, and then as you pick it up, its center of gravity shifts and it exerts forces on the actuator. It's staggeringly difficult robotics, which only really exists in the grocery space. So we, we play in that field, and we, we're uh, aggressively pursuing it, we're trialing it live. We're not picking the full range yet. Yeah, very interesting simulations. Okay. I actually have one question too. Uh, sure. On the simulation, how do you, do you have special handling of concurrent events? Yes. Uh, that's a really fun thing you can do with discrete event simulations. Yes. So to, to run the big sites, the many thousands of bot sites, you have to be able to uh, split over multiple machines. It is a cluster that actually keeps that, uh, keeps the throughput up. So how do you actually make sure that works? Well, what you do is you put it through the scheduler. So instead of I execute an event, it pauses the clock for everyone because I'm a discrete event simulation and I get a result instantly. You actually schedule an event to say that the computation is finished and then act on that. And you can then, of course, put randomness in how long that takes, so it becomes a sampled thing. And that finds all of your out-of-order problems that you would typically have had to debug in a nasty actual concurrent space. So we wrote all of the parallelization that we use in production against a repeatable discrete event simulation, and then just, just chucked Acker at the bottom of it and turned it on and it worked. It, it's phenomenally powerful. But you, you do have to um, explicitly code for it because yeah. discrete event is inherently <coughs> single-threaded. Okay, any more questions? Well, then thanks, Matt. Thank you very much.